Hello. 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 I'm looking really rough because I've just driven three hours back in Devon where I've been walking it on Dartmoor um, for, a, for an injured jockey's fun challenge with this really gopping shirt on. It's a horrible colour, but I'm going to put it up as a sort of prize for somebody if they sponsor us. Or give oh, wow. five, yeah, I'll wash it as well before I give it away. Do you think that's good? I think that's a great idea. I must admit, though, Claire, I think yellow's your colour. It's really not. My brother said he liked it. And I said, well, look, this is my idea. I'm going to get people to give like a minimum five pound donation and then I'll randomly select uh, a winner and they can have the shirt. And he said, but I like the shirt. Um, I'm going to give you 10 pounds, but you need to make sure I win. And I said, no, it doesn't oh. work like that. It does not Does work it? like that. So, yeah. Fair play. You might raise a little bit more money if, um, if you don't wash it. I mean, that is worth a lot of money, I reckon. I thought I'd offer to wash it, but then if somebody didn't want it washed, they, that, that, they could do that too. I mean, that's a conference you know. exclusive right there. I'm yeah, just... exactly. Anyway, I need to apologise to you. I'm so sorry about yesterday. This challenge, I have to walk a certain amount every day, and I left it quite late in the day to do my work. I was off hiking up a hill, completely oblivious to the fact that I was meant to be joining you at six and then tried to get a hold of you from like just after six thirty. I went oh my god I forgot no, I forgot. no I forgot. trouble there is so one sorry. of those I, I feel like um you're just doing me a favor with delaying and um, post uh prolonging my birthday celebrations for a little bit longer so I'm not I'm oh not that's good do you think it built up tension as well oh. like like then it was like is she really going to be there to be well, fair, I had a lot of messages from, well, a lot of my friends, actually, my school friends that are obviously big fans. Um, they thought that I've made it all up. They, <laughs> they, they didn't believe me initially. And then they've said, um, so you kind of saved the day. So I do appreciate it. Um, okay. and, and to be honest, I don't think it gets any bigger than this. So thank you very much for joining me on Couple Matter. It really, really means a oh, lot. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Um, so I think it'd be a little bit rude of me not to do um, a little bit of a background introduction to yourself. Um, okay. I mean, I think I could take the full 30 minutes of the natter talking about your achievements, but I'm all too aware that people don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from you. No, um, no, they don't want to hear about my achievements. That's mainly, I don't really have any, so. I mean, like, I, mean I, I haven't played sport to any high level. I haven't competed at an Olympic Games. I haven't won a medal. Claire, you know. you're the broadcasting you are god um but yeah so in terms of olympic games which is obviously the special for this cover and natter series you've um you know covered many olympic and paralympic games which i'll be picking your brains upon uh, in a little bit but also obviously the face and voice of horse racing coverage in this country since 1998 but not um, for the last three years i mean it's been incredible. I want to pick your brains on that as well, the horse racing. Um, Sports Personality of the Year, Wimbledon, Crafts, um, the Claire Baldwin Show on BT, some royal events such as Troop in the Colour, yeah. which I was going to go to this year, actually, which I was being disappointed. Mm. Yeah, but um, I mean, the list goes on, as well as obviously being a, a best selling and award winning author. Um, I mean, I just, I'm in awe already and I cannot wait for the next 30 minutes. So thank you again for joining me. Oh, bless you. When I hear that though, I think, God, who is that person? I really don't like her. She's a real overachiever. Why has she done all those things? It's just so stupid to keep trying to impress your father. Isn't that pathetic? But he is impressed now. It's very sweet. I mean, that's I'm okay. Sure. I can stop. <laughs> oh, we, we can't let you. You are literally the face of uh, and voice of sport in this country. So we need you to carry on if that's all right. But okay. you, I mean, you've made a lot of people proud, I can imagine. But um, yeah, I mean, we might as well kick things off. Okay. So I start every cover and natter finding out what everyone wants to know about my guests. It's how you like your tea. Okay. So I'm going to do this by asking you five quick fire questions, if that's all right. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Breakfast tea or herbal tea? Breakfast tea. Earl Grey, Yorkshire or Twinings? Yorkshire. Yeah, lots of people say that. Okay, sugar, milk or neither? Milk, one sugar. Interesting. Okay. Digestive, 
hobnob or chocolate chip cookie? Hobnob's quite good for dunking. Mm, get you. Mm. Um, and also, when is the best time to have a cup of tea? Is it in the morning or in the evening? In the morning. And can I let you into a secret? Alice, my wife, brings me a cup of tea every morning. Oh, you've got the brain she... sorted. I tell you, this is, this is, this is my, you know, I never understand why, why straight marriage caught on, you know, because like, that doesn't happen. Anyway, um, oh, I'm sure it does in some relationships, <laughs> but it has to be really special. Yeah. So she wakes up quite a bit earlier than I do, and I get a cup of tea at sort of 8.30. Wowza, I'm very impressed. Do you return the favour later on in the day or is it very much? I make, I, I, I'll make a pot of, I mean, we then like coffee after, after, she doesn't really drink tea, so she drinks coffee right from the word go. But after about nine o'clock, we'll be on to the first pot of really nice coffee. Yeah. And one or other of us will make that. I will always make sure, I'll always offer her a drink in the evening, which never wants one. Tactical, that is, that is tactical. I know, I say, can I make you a gin and tonic? No. I'll have a juice. Okay. Occasionally, occasionally she might say yes. If it's like a really nice sunny evening or pims maybe, I say, well, should we sit in the garden and have a gin and tonic? And she goes, oh, that'd be nice. And then she'll make a gin and tonic about that big last all night long. Oh. I, I can't do I that. I bet that's not the case for you then, no? Say again? I bet that's not the case for you, making it last that long, right? My type of girl, no chance. Okay, well... Fair enough. I'm, I'm interested to hear that, obviously, Claire, Claire Baldin likes her tea, um, preferably made by her, her wife. So you yes. Heard it here. She um, makes a really nice cup of tea. Yeah. Three years of practice, I'll bet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, I, I've, I've pre-warned you that I ask all of my Papa and Nata guests three questions, okay? So I feel like I want to kick things off considering the theme of this series is on the Olympic and Paralympic Games. So like, as a GB women's hockey player, uh, having trained the last four years in the build-up to the pinnacle of our sport, which should have been this summer, the Olympic Games, I think it'd be rude for me not to talk about uh, the Olympics and all that is amazing about it, okay? Um, having touched upon it earlier, you, you've covered, is it six Summer Olympic and five Paralympic Games in your career? Yes. Yeah, I mean yes. that. This would have been number seven. Yeah, seven, seven for Olympics and six for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's been in a BAFTA for your expert coverage and outstanding contribution at the London 2012 Olympic Games, which is, I mean is pretty impressive in itself. Yeah. I basically um, want BAFTA because the team won so many gold medals and it made everyone feel really good, and they just thought we need to give somebody something. Let's give it to Claire. That's what happened. I, I don't believe that's a seven. It was goosebumps from start to finish. It was unbelievable. But I guess I want to pick your brain because I, along with millions, watched the greatest Olympic moments that yourself and Gabby Logan uh, aired on BBC One this weekend. Did you see her try and kick me? I mean, I saw it all. I saw her reading Nick Skeleton's book and everything like that. <laughs> uh, Nick Skeleton. <laughs> um, oh. But I want to know from yourself, having had so many you know, years of experience within the Olympic and Paralympic Games, if you yourself had to narrow it down to one highlight or performance or, or moment that really stands out for yourself, what would it be? I think, I do think when the show jumping team won the gold medal in London, that was amazing. It was yeah. just amazing. Cause so I know in every sport, the margins are tiny, but you could literally breathe too hard on a pole in show jumping and it comes down and that's it yeah. game over you're not winning a medal at all and that was really exciting and dramatic and it hadn't happened in show jumping since like 1952 or something i mean it was really that was a really great moment and we were I, and it wasn't the highest profile moment at all because we were on bbc3 for that i think we should have been on bbc1 but anyway we were, we were on bbc3 and there was this big delay between the the before the jump off and they were with us live and i was standing there and basically the presenter saying what's happening i said Do you know i don't know hang on i'll just ask somebody can you just go so i call over the chef to go i said what is actually happening here why is there a delay then i climbed on a chair and started interviewing people in the crowd and i just got to improv you know improvise 
in a way that I quite enjoy on BBC Three that I probably wouldn't have been able to do on BBC One. And then obviously they go into the jump off and they win. And then they all come yeah. over. And then that night I tried to get them on for the highlight show that Gabby was presenting. And we had to get them on the top floor of a pub for some reason in Greenwich Village. And, and they, didn't, they didn't come over as sober as they were. I'll put it that way. But they definitely didn't... seemed very drunk and they weren't actually very drunk. So it's like the weirdest thing. I don't know what happened, but they seemed suddenly not to make any sense at all. I think they were tired. I think they were just tired. That was great. But yeah. I also think my team, obviously, my, my, I'm an honorary member, as you probably know, of the GB hockey team, even though I've never played hockey in my life. Love it. I am an honorary member. And um, I did think that as a, as a dramatic, again, you know, the show dummy went to a jump, oh, gets a jump off and they win it by, a, you know, not very much. The hockey goes to extra time and penalties and they win it convincingly, obviously, in penalties. But to get to that point was so nerve wracking. And again, it hadn't been done by the women's team before. Oh, here's a quiz question for you, which you right. probably know, Emily. When were women first allowed to play hockey at the Olympics? Oh, you put me on the spot. I wouldn't, I'm not too sure. I think it's 1980. I yeah. think it was 1980. So, it, and, and the other, here's another quiz question. When were women first allowed to run in the marathon at the Olympics? Go on. 1984. Yeah. When were women first allowed to compete in cycling in any event? And in and the beginning, it was only the road race. What year? I feel like I'm going to be horrified, aren't I? Again, that's 1984. And they weren't allowed on the track until... I think 92 and even then it was only the sprint they were only I mean it is it is ridiculous how a lot of women's sport has just had to play such slow catch-up and then suddenly you're allowed to you know all the events are now equal and and some events obviously don't have that depth of talent because there hasn't been the tradition of playing it and still in some countries there are some sports that just girls don't do they're not they just don't do it um yeah. yet yet i always say that yet yeah, um great. so yeah it's been fa so i felt that that women's hockey team and because of their you know their whole ethos i felt was really positive and i thought they were very aware of the bigger message that this is more about them this is about more than what we do on the pitch and i therefore felt after it they really maximize that opportunity to spread the message of team what a team means you know what is it to be part of a team and and what is it to show leadership or encourage leadership in others and and what does it mean to be bold enough to say we're going to create history and then do it i felt all of that gives me goosebumps yeah i really liked that yeah cool. I'm, I'm not gonna be biased but i couldn't agree more i think it's one of those isn't it I think everyone will remember where they were on that famous night in Rio when the hockey girls won gold. Um, yeah. And I think the sport gained so many more more viewers, interest, coverage off of the back of that night. And as you said, I think the power of sport is huge, but for a women's sports team to make history in such exciting fashion as they did, I mean, I'm going to be biased, of course, but yeah. It's I really felt it, you know, I really felt, and I do know where I was because I was standing in the park watching it on, in Rio, watching it on a tiny screen, thinking, oh God, it's probably too late to get them. And Nick Skelton was the same day. He won his individual gold medal the same day. So he came in to do an interview and I'm saying, it's gone to penalties, it's gone to penalties. And he's standing with me watching the screen. Oh. I said, buddy, are they going to win this? They're going to win this. So it was really exciting. And then when the whole team came the next day and Krista Cullen had the big bump on her head, yeah. you know? <laughs> and I, you're really tempted to do that kind of what Murray Walker did to, um, um, what's he called? I had a blank. What's the, Nigel Mansell, when he literally did that to his head on the big bump. <laughs> the, temptation, the temptation was too soon. But am I, am I correct in thinking as well? Obviously you went down very well with the hockey girls and you're even part of the group. You were part of them. I was part of the WhatsApp group and um, somebody's just rung the doorbell. Hang on one second. Alice, yeah. someone's just rung the doorbell. Um, I don't know who that is, how exciting. Buttons just there. Um, I'm going to look out the window just so I 
Yeah, who is it? Let us oh, know. Delivery, it's delivery, nice. delivery. Oh. It's delivery. That's okay. It's probably for next door, actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I was. Um, so what happened <laughs> is that, as you know, 2016 was also the year that Leicester City won the Premier League at odds of 5,000 to 1, which was an amazing, amazing yeah. achievement. And therefore, there was, what was it? Uh, next door, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> something for next door. Um, so, at Sports Personality of the Year, there is an award for Team of the Year, and there's an award for Coach of the Year. And Claudio Ranieri got Coach of the Year, which made everyone quite rightly think that means GB Hockey Women have yeah. got Team of the Year. But Leicester City also got Team oh. of the Year, which I still feel is basically two awards for the same thing. I yeah. think you had to choose one gets one and one gets the other. So I was pretty devastated for, for the girls and they were all there and, and they, you know, and I've been in those situations where they're, you're up for an award and you hear the runner up or what, and you think, oh God, it's me. <laughs> I, I start to get up and then you hear someone else's name and it's pretty, you know, upsetting. So we partied to make up for it. And I kept saying to them, you're my team of the year. And I still say it now, you're oh. my, you are my team of the year. And we, I tried to make the music carry on at the disco. That was slightly embarrassing. And then I said to everyone, let's go upstairs. There's this fantastic bar on the top of the, um, uh, what's called the Genting Hotel in, in, in Birmingham. And I've stayed there a lot because it's where we stay for crafts. Mm -hmm. So I kind of know, it's my territory. I know. I said, let's go upstairs. Anyway, they're discussing their WhatsApp group. Now, as I remember it, Helen Richardson Walsh said, you should be in our group. As she oh. tells it, she says, I grabbed Kate's phone and put myself in the group. I wouldn't do that. They were begging me to be in the group. So I'm oh. in the WhatsApp group. I'm in the WhatsApp group. And all the messages start firing through the next morning about how rough everybody feels. And Hannah McLeod had had to get up early to go off and do something really sensible and, you know, work-based. <laughs> and everybody else is sort of in bits and have ended up in places they'd probably don't know quite where they are so i'm seeing all these messages coming in and then they put up some videos from the singing the night before and dancing it's great and then i then they will start discussing all the next appearances and don't forget to bring your kit and all of that and so i'm just observing and i'm feeling really proud and i come home and i say to alice i'm in the hockey group and she's like you're not you've never played hockey in your life i know but i'm in the team i'm basically <laughs> now an honorary member of the team so this goes on for a couple of days and then I put up a few messages, which is my big mistake. I shouldn't have said anything because they'd have forgotten I was there. Because then Kate rings me, Kate Richardson Walsh rings me and she says, you know, Claire, it's just been great having you as part of the group. It's been really fun and we really appreciate your support. But, you know, the thing is, and I said, what? She said, well, the thing is, we kind of got to discuss things on there that really you shouldn't be party to because you are in the media and it's it's our private space and it's our team and it's really important to us and, and I'm going to have to take you out of the group. Oh! I was, Savage. it was so brave, can I tell you? I was so brave because I just went, yeah, yeah, absolutely, totally understand, you know, and yeah, thanks for ringing to let me know. And I thought it was pretty good captaincy actually that she rings me direct, tells me before and she said, look, I'll just give you last chance, say goodbye and everyone say goodbye to you. So, I say goodbye to everybody on the WhatsApp group. Really nice messages come through. Great having you, blah, blah, blah. And I am standing in the kitchen next door, holding the edge of the island when Alice comes back from work. And oh. she walks in and she looks at me and she said, oh, my God, what's happened? Has somebody, has somebody died? And I said, no. And she said, but what's the matter with you? I've never seen you look like this. And I said, they've dropped me from the WhatsApp. <laughs> she started laughing. And I've got tears coming down my face. I'm really upset about it. I really liked being in the WhatsApp group. I'm <laughs> I still, I still, so Krista had asked me to help out at their Tafauti, you know, her Tafauti Foundation at the ball. And I and I told the story about the WhatsApp group um, on stage with Kate in the oh. room and, and said that she had to call me and kick me out of the group. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this as a cover and natter exclusive. Supposedly, Claire Baldwin was added into the group, but I've heard from really reliable sources that actually Claire Baldwin added herself into <laughs> the GB Women's Squad group for her then to be phoned by Kate Richardson Walsh to then get the boot, and you're devastated, heartbroken. Never quite, you, you know. I may never actually get over it. You know but what? It was 
it was like it was like I lived in this little dream bubble for a while where I really thought I was in the team. Claire, you've still got time. We've got another year until yeah. Christmas now. So this no, is that's true. Time. Exactly. I could make the big comeback like Krista, except that I've never played hockey. That's my problem. You know what? I think we could stick you up front and you'd do a job. Yeah, just do it. I'm brave. I'm really but, brave. But can I just ask, okay, so considering I've rattled off all of the many sports that you've worked on in your career, there is one big gap there. And seeing as though you are part of the WhatsApp, well, were, yeah. sorry, part of the WhatsApp group, you've said that the girls winning in Rio was one of the highlights. Could you make the dream happen? Could you work within the hockey world in the future? Well, I was meant to for BT Sport, um, but then everything got cancelled. I was meant to be doing hockey this summer. No. So I would have been, this spring rather. Yeah, it was this year, wasn't it? Oh, and then obviously everything was off. Um, yeah, I was really looking forward to that. I thought I can, I can show not necessarily my knowledge, but I can definitely share my interest and excitement and my, my, I can share my vision for the team. That's what I can do. The dream is still on. Okay, I'm holding on to yes. that hope. But very, very interesting. Um, and I guess, okay, so I guess this leads me on quite nicely to my next question which is, I've obviously said that you, you've covered a broad range of sports. Your expertise across so many different sports is absolutely incredible, so impressive. But the first love was always horse racing. So a question, is that still the case after all these years working in loads of different sports and events, or is, is horse racing still the number one for you? It's interesting because I, you know, I have worked on racing from the day I started in broadcasting until the end of 2016 and I haven't presented it since 2016 and I'm on the board at Epsom so I, I you know I'm quite strongly involved I've got to try and find a new sponsor for the Derby in the Oaks now because yeah. Investec obviously as you know oh. Investec changing their priorities slightly so therefore no more hockey no more no more Epsom either um but I haven't presented racing for three years, mm. nearly four, nearly four. Yes. And it's weird because I thought I would really struggle with it. And actually I haven't because I get to go racing if I want to go racing. I watch racing. My brother, the race horse trainer. There's plenty of racing in my life. You know, it's fine. Uh -huh. um, I really, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an eventer. I wanted to be a three-day eventer. So eventing in equestrian world has been a massive part of my life. And I've presented badminton actually for longer on television than anything I've ever done. That was the first live show I ever presented back in 95 or something, 94 or 95, 95 must have been. And um, that's been weird not to do that this year and not to do, and Burley's been cancelled as well. So I'm, I'll miss that. Um, and I don't know whether we'll be back up and running no. for show jumping at Olympia. I don't know. Um, but it'll be really strange to have a whole year, if there's no Olympia, to have a whole year without presenting a single horse event will be very odd yeah. but it's just you know I kind of think one of the most important things and I think sports people are very good at this is being flexible in your thinking you don't have to be the same thing for the whole of your life mm -hmm. and when you're an athlete you know you can't be because there will come a stage probably a bit sooner than you wish that you'll have to not play at that level anymore and therefore you have to be quite nimble of thought as well as you know confident in yourself and all those things so I've been flexible enough all the way through that, like you said, I've presented Crufts for a long time. Crufts, although I treat it like a major sporting event, is not actually technically a sports event. Um, I've done ramblings on Radio 4 for 20 years. That's a walking programme on the radio. I've written books for, you know, the last eight, eight years. That's, again, they're not, they're not books about sport per se. Um, yeah. They are, they all include an interest of, either horses or sport but you know they're not they're not factual books about sports so there's enough other stuff going on that I've not felt that I needed to be defined by racing um and there was a time when I could have been um and there's a time when I absolutely could have gone down that path and only done racing but I was quite resistant to it because I just didn't want I never really 
you don't know if you're any good at what you do if you only stick to the one sport that's been in your family where you've got all the contacts where you know you feel safe and you kind of know the language you know yeah. so until I ended up doing other things like rugby league for example yeah. I didn't know whether I was actually any you know are you doing this because you know because it's your you know it's your home turf and you kind of get away with it because you know what you're on about or can you do it in an area that's not your home turf so I wanted to prove that I could in a way I think um your ability to adapt over your career has been second to none and to be honest I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of many people when saying thank god that you did branch out because <laughs> there's so many events that yourself your coverage your enthusiasm and everything that comes with it has made the sporting event 10 times better than what it could have been so oh, thank you. but no. it's interesting it, the, the timing when I when I was doing that at the early stage of my career grandstand and Sunday grandstand still existed yeah. so to be a you know you look at Des Lynam or, or Steve Ryder or Sue or or Hazel or Gabby everybody was um, I'm John Invidel a multi-sport presenter it's not like that anymore because of because of the influence of Sky, but also because the BBC doesn't anymore have a general sports program and nor does ITV. Everyone goes sports specific. So it's really interesting now how many, despite the fact I've worked on Wimbledon for more than 20 years in radio and television, I'll still get people saying stick to the horses. What do you mean stick to the horses? I don't present the horses anymore. And I've actually done the tennis for longer than I did the racing. So what does that mean? But it's because everybody's out of the habit of thinking that a, a presenter can present the sport and your analyst is the one that needs to be sport specific. But actually as well, because of the great success of many athletes in going into presenting, you will also run the risk of people saying, well, what would you know you didn't play the game? No one ever said that to Motti. Nobody ever said that to Murray Walker. You never drove the car. And, and actually nobody ever said it to Des Lynham. Or David Coleman. So it's just, you, you know, it's become the, tr the, the, the it's become very common for people who have, that the, they are absolute experts in that one sport. I prefer the variety and I like to learn about sports. I also think it gives you the, gives you the scope to ask a question that the viewer at home would like to know the answer such as why would you never look at reflective material on a sprint bike so that you don't spend the whole race turning around like that now a cyclist yeah. can't ask that question because they would be worried about sounding silly i can ask and yeah. chris Hoy gave the most brilliant answer about it and said they really did they looked at all the ways in which could they use some form of mirroring and but without without interfering with the aerodynamics of the bike is the most important thing was to be streamlined but he absolutely agreed that riding along with your head like that it's not it's not no. great recipe for disaster if you ask yeah yeah and i remember once asking in rugby league um did they ever put so they were putting powder they they were putting powder on their hands obviously for catching the ball to make sure their hands were see and i said oh, do you ever put powder on your feet on the on your boot and because you know, it seemed to me that, you know, leather would slip off as much as your skin would if it was wet. Yeah. And Ian Millwood, I think it was, a really good coach, um, Aussie coach who was working over here, gave them, he was really interesting about me and he didn't treat me like an idiot. He said, that, do you know, I've never considered that. That's a really interesting point. We might try that in training and see if it, and you suddenly get a conversation that you just wouldn't have um. because you because you're in a position where you can ask it's not the idiot question because it's not an idiot question. It's it's a question that is from someone who's not entrenched in the game, but is really interested and is observing it and saying, why wouldn't you try this? So it's I, I really enjoy that aspect of it. I love asking questions and I genuinely am curious to know the answer. So that kind of works in a lot of environments. It's quite interesting you hear uh, you saying it because you know you you. You, you obviously do have a breadth of expertise across loads of different sports, but actually the fact that you're still learning on the job, even now, is quite interesting. I mean, like what you were saying about asking the questions that everyone wants to hear, it just came to my head in terms of, on series one, I had Eve Muirhead um, on, and I was asking her about her Shirley, shoes. Yeah. I never understand how they don't fall over yeah. like, when they're sliding, gliding down the ice. So I asked that, and then Katie Archibald, the... Yes, the cyclist, and I was asking her about the Madison because, like, yeah. 
a teammate and dragging them along. I mean, that is a skill in itself. I'm, I'm baffled as to how they don't connect. And she did it. Did she tell you about doing it with a broken wrist? Oh, she's phenomenal. And isn't she? I mean, she, she basically competed in that after she'd had a bad fall. And, and she could hardly, I don't know how she could pull at all. Because I, her wrist was pretty much smashed. Yeah. I mean, she, she is. She's yeah. phenomenally, she's a great athlete. She'd have been good, I think, in any sport she went into. You know, when you see people and you just go, well, you'd have been fantastic at hockey if you played hockey. Yeah. Been, yeah. She's a real, real fighter, real competitor. I mean, she, yeah, she's won it all, hasn't she, in cycling. Yeah. So maybe we could recruit her up front as well for the GB Women's Hockey Yes. Team. Katie yeah. Archibald and me will be your, you know, your incomers, your, you, yeah. That'll be, right. that'll, take, that'll take the Netherlands by surprise. <laughs> uh, give me five minutes and I'll add you to the WhatsApp group and then we'll make it happen. No dramas. Um, but, okay, so third question, it again leads nicely onto what you're saying about, um, you know, learning more about um, Rugby Football League. So I think it'd be rude for me not to wish you a huge congratulations on your new appointment okay. as the RFL president. I, yeah, I can of, show you my... Um, because I, it's it's here. Um, I was you were going to bring it out. <laughs> I'm not sure it looks so good with this really weird t-shirt, but there is my oh. chains. There's my wow. chains. Isn't that good? I mean, hey. that's pretty impressive, isn't it? I mean, huge congratulations. I mean, this time last week, you were on um, showing off your bling on the BBC uh, One Show, which is one of my favourite TV programmes. And this week, you're sharing it with Emily DeFron's Cupper and Natter. So I feel very honoured. <laughs> But no, in all seriousness, congratulations on your on your role. And as an avid uh, campaigner for obviously women's sport and the growing coverage within women's sport, uh, you've outlined that one of your main aims um, over the next couple of years is trying to grow women's rugby league. Um, mm -hmm. So I just want to pick the brains. How do you intend on making you know women's rugby league bigger and better than ever before? I think at the moment, it is not even in the thought process of a lot of sporty girls at school. And that's the first thing you need to change is making sure they know that this is an option for them. I think also showing them that it is a game that it, it really rewards um, teamwork, um, but also athleticism. It's a very, it's even more of a running game than the men's version. Um, it is, it's going to be, I think because it's not professional yet, but I think it's on the up and I think there's going to be an opportunity for that to come about where you could actually make a living from it, mm -hmm. not just have to finance it by your own kit. The World Cup gives gives the sport a fantastic opportunity because the World Cup next year, for the very first time, I think in any sport, is men's, women's and wheelchair all at the same time, all running concurrently. So hockey's had men's and women's running concurrently, hasn't it? And that's the sort of standard um, um, format for, for hockey and I think that's true in, in a few other sports but they definitely haven't had wheelchair as well so for it to be hosted here and it's going to be big and I think the chance is to build off the back of that when people see the women's final being played at Old Trafford on the same day as the men's final you know that's huge and if England can get to that final if they could win that final you're then talking about using that momentum over the next months and I think that's where I can be of most value I want to help obviously promote the World Cup and get people to come to it, it, it you know let's hope we're in a position by next November that that's possible but as in November 2021 um, and then I think after it is it's to go to schools and say right what's your program and can we help you if you haven't got a program can we help you it's uh, interesting, isn't it because I think with, with all women's sport at the moment, if you can't be what you can't see, and we need to, you know, show all of these remarkable women playing a broad range of sports, and the coverage is a huge factor of that. But as you said, I mean, a home World Cup and having success at a home World Cup where the men and the wheelchair are alongside, seen as the equals. What perfect yeah. opportunity for you and the yeah. whole RFL to jump on that? Yeah. Band and they do you know they're a really forward thinking open minded sport yeah. and actually somebody said to me the other day oh, i assume you're the first female president i said no i'm not the first female president was in 1995 and yeah. it's a sport that i think is much more um welcoming um 
in terms of they really care about inclusion and, and diversity and they are working they know they've still got you know a fair bit to do but compared to some other sports yeah. um they are amazingly far down the line you know they have a pride day keithley for rugby league club have a they basically are affiliated with pride and there was one team a few years back that wore pink um the whole season to basically say we we are gay friendly so you know if you've got a problem don't come here <laughs> yeah well i mean it sounds like a lot of sports can learn from what they're doing as well and obviously yeah. having yourself on board i'm sure it's going to go from strength to strength so wishing you all the very best with that one thank you no not at all okay well i, I feel like i've spoken enough and asked enough questions and i must admit to you i have been at i mean understandably i've been bombarded with questions from social media for you so if you don't mind i know we're running over have you got time for a couple of social yeah media go on questions? go on right. okay um all very good i must admit okay so andy would like to know is there an individual involved within sport either past or present that you have never had the opportunity to interview and wish you could I would love to have interviewed Muhammad Ali in his yeah. pod. I would have loved to have done that. I met him when we did Sports Personality of the Century in 2000. He won that, not surprisingly. And I was one of the presenters. There were five presenters that year. And I was very much the junior one, but I was one of them. And I remember yeah. after it, standing, watching him and watching everybody around him and thinking, gosh, I can't, I, I don't, I, it was like, I mean, it was really nice because everyone, you know, they're really high profile sports people in that room. And it wasn't a public audience. It was all, you know, they were all athletes or coaches or, or you know, execs or whatever. And he had such presence, even ravaged by Parkinson's. He had such presence. Yeah. yeah and that would have been a great change. You know, he had real charisma as well and funny yeah. and sharp. And that, I think that's the dream you, you want to have interviewed him, really. Especially as someone so iconic as well. I bet mm. it's one of those, it's quite, I mean. Yeah, quite, and it's yeah. interesting now. And actually now I would put top of the list Marcus Rashford. I, I, I am so in awe of him and, and Raheem Sterling. And I think it, having the ability to, uh, for, for a long time, and even this happened to, to Muhammad Ali, when he used his position of, and his profile to object to the war, and when he refused to sign up and, and consequently, you know, got in big trouble for it he was really really harshly criticized and i think there has been um and billy jean king same thing when she basically yeah. spoke up for, for equality and founded the wta there's always been this slight feeling from the establishment of you're just sports people you don't have a right to say these things and i think that the combination of black lives matter and covid has created a new wave of athletes who are willing to say what they believe and to see everybody at the beginning you know when the premier league restarted to see oh. everybody following what colin kaepernick started and and he was roundly disowned you, you know criticized by president trump for for doing it but to see everyone taking the knee including the referee i think that's remarkable i think we've in a very short space of time that is a big shift that that you as an athlete will not i hope ever hesitate in using your voice to try and affect positive change and i think that's a you know that's a huge leap forward but yeah i think as well like we've seen that haven't we especially over the last few months where sports men yeah. are using their platform for good yeah i think sports yeah the most powerful thing within society and actually the positive change can stem from sport and we've seen it from the likes of sterling rashford um, yeah, yeah Coco Goff, the speech she gave in Florida was oh. amazing. You know, she's phenomenal. really impressive. She is going to be, yeah, I mean, she's phenomenal. She's great, really great player, but really good talker too. Yeah. Um, okay, I mean, very, yeah, Muhammad Ali, fair enough. Okay, one more, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, we'll go for, um, oh, okay, Pat would like to know, Pat on Instagram would like to know, if there was one sporting event that you could personally participate in, what would it be? If there was one sport that I could participate in? Yeah. God, I have this really romantic notion of diving off the 10 metre oh. ball. And it's really because of Barcelona and that iconic, you know, Greg Lagarnes and all that. But 
Oh, no. No, no, I'm here. Um, my sister oh, yeah, was trying to right. ring me and I just had to turn her off. Um, I, but I can't dive, so that would be silly. I've never played hockey. Would, you so would I want to do it? Oh, I'd want to be good at it. Yeah, I just think it's such a beautiful you'd, sport. You'd bomb off the top of the platform. Yeah, then, bomb off the top of... platform. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I do. Bomb off the top platform. The other, like, if it was Winter Olympics, I'd love to be a downhill skier. I just think it's so exciting and adrenaline. So there's, I like the danger ones. I think I like them anyway. But realistically, yeah. it would have been one of the, it would have either been eventing or show jumping. Not dressage, because I'm not very good. I'm really not very good at that. But eventing, I'd have loved to have been. I remember that when the team won silver in um, Sydney, I was standing with Tina Cook, who's a great mate of mine, and she was reserved for the team and travelling reserve, in floods of tears, just oh. watching them on that podium. And it was only a silver medal. I'd be in bits if they ever win a gold in my lifetime. Cheapest. Well, no, but I, I, it's, it's one of those, isn't it? I think with the um, equestrian at the Olympic Games, it just, it, it captures you. Yeah. It pulls on your heartstrings as well. Like, I was watching um, the, the, the show at the weekend and, you know, the Nick Skelton I know. coverage. I was literally, I was the kind bottom of, look. Like, just incredible. Yeah, it's really good. It's really, it is. It's exciting because also you're relying on another living being and that's pretty rare. Anyway. Yeah, it's a talent in itself. But I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that that's a tricky, trickier question. But either the diving, the downhill skiing or... I mean, you're covering it all, aren't well, you? I'm cover it all, exactly. <laughs> um, well, anyway, I am very wary that I said it was going to be 30 minutes and I've gone well over. My cup of tea is very empty as well. But honestly, I can't thank you enough for agreeing to be part of this. As I said, I don't think this gets any bigger. So thank oh, you very much for being I'm so sorry generous. it was 24 hours later than it was meant to be. And I'm going to ring back my sister-in-law now because it was her I was walking with yesterday and tell her that I did the thing that I was then panicking about. Go, oh my God, I forgot, I forgot, I forgot. Anyway, she'll be pleased that we've done this. I uh, well, thank, thank your sister as well on my behalf for allowing you to, to join me today. <laughs> but for everyone else, thank you very much for joining us. Um, keep that kettle boiled. Keep nattering using hashtag Cupper and Natter. My next guest will be revealed on Thursday at 6pm. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And then I'll see you again, same time, same place, next Monday for episode two. But Claire, thank you so much. I do You're really- You're very welcome. I'm sorry I hadn't got my hair sorted for the occasion or like indeed put on any makeup, but never mind. <laughs> you know, and yellow is definitely your colour, don't you worry. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna press the little cross here. Is that what I do? Take yeah. care, thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Take care, bye.